Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. Remlois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Thanks everybody for braving the uh, frozen water out there today. Um, very apt. Uh, I think I have uh, an interesting uh, topic. Water is something I think we're all very familiar with. And also, I think I'll, I'll try to explain to you that there are some surprises in something that is so uh, we're so very familiar with. OK, so the, just sort of an outline, uh, kind of. It's not a, a linear outline of what I'm going to talk about. But we're going to journey a bit. Uh, and one of the places we'll journey is, is back to the beginning of time. Uh, to when the universe was born, very briefly, because this talk is not about that or anywhere near that. Uh, but then we'll talk a little bit about where stars are born. And stars are born in these giant clouds of gas and tiny particles uh, that we call actually molecular clouds, because they're mostly molecular in composition. And then gravity wins in some of these regions, and they collapse to form stars. And alongside the stars, you, of course, get things that we're very familiar with, or one that we're familiar with, at the very least, planets, and, and this one very beautiful world of our own that we call Earth that, of course, is covered by two-thirds of its surface, at least, is covered by water, liquid water. OK, and, and right now, certain portions up here are also covered by solid water. OK, so. Uh, Water is uh, very important. And this chart here shows you the fraction of your body that is, uh, has, the, I guess, the elements uh, by mass that make up most of your body. And most of your body actually is oxygen to the tune of 65%. And so you, everyone in this room, that oxygen is from water. Okay. So you're mostly water, and the planet's mostly water. That's really amazing, right? And water uh, also plays a very important role in, in our chemistry, in the, in the biochemistry of what makes us what we are. Okay. So uh, some things, it's uh, a medium in the sense of uh, it allows for we eat carbon based things, you know, carbohydrates and things like that. These are carbon-based chemicals that actually our body uses to nourish itself and get energy. And water is one of the mediums that moves that stuff around in our body and allows us to metabolize it and for me to walk back and forth and talk and everything like that. Okay, So water is very, very important for the chemistry of life. And its unique freezing properties actually also help to maintain stability of life on our planet. So if you look at water here, here's liquid water. The molecules are actually much closer together uh, in liquid water than they are in solid water. So the density of liquid water uh, is higher than that of its solid form, which is actually an oddity amongst all the other potential liquids that the Earth could have started with. And why is that interesting? Well, uh, what that means is actually that ice floats, right? And so if you think of what would happen uh, if ice didn't float is if you look at our oceans, the stuff on the top would freeze. It would sink to the bottom. The top would freeze. It would sink to the bottom. And you would very, very rapidly freeze a large fraction of your liquid water. And that, of course, is not conducive uh, to life very much, and solids at least. OK, so here we are. We have two hydrogens and an oxygen right here. It's also called dihydrogen monoxide. And here's this very amusing thing I got off the web about how DHMO, dihydrogen monoxide, kills, right? You could die by inhalation. It corrodes metals. It does. It's actually, uh, let's see, it's part of baby food uh, somewhere down here. Uh, uh, well, we won't even talk about torture. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> used in nuclear plants, uh, found in acid rain. Uh, so should we ban this thing? And of course, this was a little tongue-in-cheek thing that somebody did to try and 
show how you can use uh, very long words and try to scare people. Uh, and a long time ago, some gentleman, maybe about 50 years ago, looked at the, the, this water molecule and had this great idea, right? <laughs> so you have H, H2O. All right, so tongue in cheek inside. Where did it come from? And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit close to us for clues as to where our water uh, came from. All right, so the two issues we, I want to talk about, really, is that the rocks that made the Earth should actually have been dry. So the water came from somewhere else in our solar system. And that's one of the things that I'll try and motivate throughout the talk. And this water had to be created somewhere. I mean, the, the universe is not filled with water. Uh, so that the water just, it just naturally appears. No, it had to form somewhere. So where and when did it form? Okay, so those are the two questions we'll try and address today. So the first clue is in the structure of our solar system. Our, our solar system has eight planets, not nine. Uh, we kicked uh, Pluto out of the planetary brotherhood, and, and we can talk about that if you want. Uh, one of the reasons why Pluto actually was kicked out, as you see its orbit, is tilted with respect to everybody else. And everybody else has a planet, or all the planets lie in a plane. And they orbit the sun in the same direction, actually, that the sun rotates. So that's one hint, OK? So the structure of our solar system, planets confined to a plane rotating in the same direction. Imagine it as a, like a Frisbee, right? OK, here's another clue. And this is a little more of a difficult plot. This is the percentage of ice and rock contained in all of the planets as a function of distance from the sun. And the distance we use in astronomy is astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is one Earth-Sun distance. And so let's just work through this here. Well, here are what we call the terrestrial worlds, the rocky worlds. They're mostly here, percentage rock. They're 100% rock and basically 0% ice. OK, so that's one thing. They actually have very little water. We have a, a, a water all over our surface, but our planet is mostly rock by a very, very large percentage. OK, now if you look in the rest of the solar system, here's Jupiter, Saturn, the percentage of ice increases going outward. So there's actually more water in the outer parts of our solar system than there is in the inner. So that's another clue that we'll take for water. All right, now this last clue is a little more difficult to understand in a way. Uh, even for uh, many astronomers, and I can attest to that. Um, but it's also very telling. And that is comes in the amount of deuterium to hydrogen that we find in the Earth's water. So here's hydrogen. You have a proton here, positive charge, and an electron. Now deuterium is just a proton and a neutron. So it's an isotope of hydrogen. So it has an abundance that's about 100,000 times that below that of hydrogen. This was created when the universe was born, and we don't think it's been created ever since. So it just, one big burst, created all the deuterium we have, and it stayed the same since. All right? Now, what happens is at very, very low temperatures, and that's 50 degrees above absolute zero, and I'm going to talk a little bit about temperature in a minute, chemistry favors the transfer of deuterium. So if I have a molecule, HD here, and it reacts with something, it's going to prefer to pass the deuterium as opposed to the hydrogen. And that happens at very cold temperatures. All right, so here's just to give you a little primer. Most of you probably know this, but I just wanted to go over it again. These are the different temperature scales. This is the one we're familiar with, Fahrenheit, and we're sadly somewhere down here. Uh, and here's Celsius, and here's Kelvin, OK? So, uh, 273 degrees Kelvin is about the freezing point of water. Uh, we're talking 50 degrees above absolute zero, which would be somewhere around about maybe minus 425 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very low temperatures. Chemistry favors the transfer of deuterium. And what this actually means is that if the temperature is less than 50 K, if you find any deuterium in water, instead of H2O, you would have HDO, that should be greater than the amount of deuterium than you see in something like hydrogen. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. 
on the next slide. And if the temperature is greater than 50 K, then you actually should have the same amount as you see in the Big Bang. All right, so here's what we see in the solar system. So this is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. This is the way what it would be. Everything along this line here formed, had water formed at temperatures greater than 50 degrees Kelvin. So that's the sun and uh, Jupiter here, OK? This is oxygen in, or the, the Earth's water. It's called standard mean ocean water. And it's way up here. Here's comets. And everything that came from here formed, at least in part, at very, very, very cold temperatures. So what this tells you, and this is a very telling clue, it says that Earth water, this standard mean ocean water that geochemists use, partially formed at very low temperatures. So that's a hint. OK. So we'll summarize our clues that we have from the solar system. Uh, the planets lie in a plane as they orbit the sun. There's more water by percentage of mass beyond the orbit of Mars. Uh, and Earth's water appears to have some contribution from a water that formed at, at very, very low temperatures, something that we just can't even fathom in terms of the temperature that we're talking about. So now we're going to go beyond the solar system and talk about astronomy. Now, astronomy is, is a, a different science than many other science in that it's a remote sense in science. We can't often touch the things we're talking about. Now, we can go to Mars and send robots, and maybe someday we'll send humans. But we can't go to the stars. We can't go to the galaxy. So what we use is we use light. Light is our bearer of information. So if you want to look at the astronomical toolbox here, what we use is the, the full spectrum that light has to offer. And human eyes, what we're used to, is only sensitive to a tiny part of that full spectrum of light. So here it is. This is visible light. So going from red, green, blue, right? What we're used to. Now, the full spectrum encompasses things like x-rays. You're very familiar with that, right, of course. Microwave. We have microwave ovens. What is that? Well, that's light, right? And you're taking the energy from light, and you're transferring that to some substance, and it comes out in the form of heat. Right? And it heats the substance up. Uh, here's radio. If you remember UHF from VHF, those of us who remember the days before cable when you couldn't get anything on that TV, well, there you go, UHF and VHF. And here's radio. OK. So we use the full spectrum of light. OK, so of course then we need to have a really good set of glasses, right? And we're not really talking about Superman here. We're talking about telescopes. And oftentimes, our telescopes are big ones. So big optical telescopes that use visible light are the biggest ones, about 15 meters in size. I'm a radio astronomer. I use telescopes that are 30, 40, 50, 100 meters in size, really big beasts. OK, so here's a picture of a galaxy in visible light. Now we're going to look at this thing in the light that comes out in the infrared in terms of heat. So here's our galaxy. Here's the center of it. Here's the spiral arms. You see these dark spots and these little red dots? These little red dots are stars that are being born. And these dark spots are the clouds that are actually born out of. And I'll show you that in the next slide a little more directly. And you see this part here in the infrared image, all this stuff here, this red stuff here, is actually coming from these dark lanes in the visible image. So when you look at these objects in different places, you're learning something different. All right? So here's another example of that. This is in our galaxy. And this is a region that's currently forming maybe about 50, 100 stars. There's these dark stuff here. And look at that. It's just shining out. These are young stars that were born about 100,000 years ago. Now what's happening here is this dark, these dark lanes is that these objects, and we call them clouds, have little tiny solid particles in them. And these tiny solid particles we call dust. And they're about the size of a tenth of a micron. And just to give you an idea, here's a human hair. All right? One micron is 0 0.00039 of an inch. So we're talking a tenth of that. So really, really small. But those really, really small things are actually what this rock that we're standing on were made out of. Right? They got together and had a big party, <laughs> a big party. 
and made a planet. Right? So another way we can do things in astronomy is <coughs> looking at the actual constituents, the elements that things are made of. And that is that atoms and molecules also emit light. So those tiny solid particles, what they're doing is they're absorbing the starlight. If you imagine a field of stars and you stick this cloud in front of it, they're absorbing the visible starlight and then they re-emit it as infrared, as heat. Okay, so it's just conservation of energy. Atoms and molecules do the same thing, but they do it in very, very specific ways. And that is they only have sort of discrete emissions. And these discrete emissions only come out in very specific parts of the spectrum of light. And there are sort of barcodes. And when you observe this barcode, you know that you're looking at a given atom or you're looking at a given molecule, all right? So this is called spectroscopy. And it's, it's one way, and it is the way, that we do chemistry in space. And I am exactly that, an astrochemist. So here is an example of that. These are atomic fingerprints. So if I look, and this is the visible spectrum here. These are just different gases. And if I take hydrogen, it emits at these characteristic wavelengths. All right? And so when you see this pattern, you know, you know you're seeing hydrogen. OK? And here's uh, carbon. That's different, right? So these things are unique barcodes or fingerprints. So that's how we can actually tell that we're looking at what we think we're looking at. Now, molecules do the same thing, but they're a little more complicated. And this is my water exercise video here. <laughs> All right? So a water molecule can do this. It can do that. It can flip. It can flap. And when it does these motions, actually, it's releasing light. So it, it takes up energy and it releases some light and we can observe that light. And the other thing that they do is they, they rotate, they spin, and that's what's shown down here. And their spin states are again regulated. Quantized is of course the right word since this is Saturday morning physics. Um, and so when they rotate, they spin and they spin down. They like to be at the low energy state, just like everything else in the universe, including us, right? That's why we have our couches. Uh, and then they emit light, and that light we can observe, all right? So these molecules actually emit primarily at radio wavelengths. So you have these gas clouds in space. They emit invisible radio waves. That goes into our radio telescopes, which are big. It goes into a signal receiver, and then we get a spectrum that looks something like what you see here. It's just a, a line going up on your plot. And you know, you're all familiar with radio waves, right? You have invisible radio waves go into your car antenna, and it's hit by your radio receiver. And you tune your radio in frequency space to whatever channel you want to listen to. We tune our telescopes to the frequency where certain molecules are emitting. All right, so if we were looking at the constellation of Orion with carbon monoxide eyes, it would look like this. So here's Orion. There's the belt right there. This is the sword. All right. This is the Orion molecular cloud. All right. This is a tiny thing, 890 trillion miles in size. All right. It's mostly, again, composed of molecules. It's mostly hydrogen, since hydrogen is the most abundant molecule or atom in the universe. So it's molecular hydrogen. And then there's trace species, of which carbon monoxide is, is a very big one. So we call these things giant molecular clouds. It's very, very cold, 20 degrees above absolute zero. All right? There's a hint there, right? All right. Uh, and this contains enough material to make over 100,000 suns in it. In fact, right here in the sort of Orion is something called the Orion Nebula. That's an area where on the order of about, what, 10,000 stars or something like that has been born in the past million years or so. OK, now here's another way of looking at things. This is the center of the galaxy. So again, you see that dark lane where those dust particles are absorbing? There it looks like, that's what it looks like in carbon monoxide. So. Wow, right? So that's, that's star formation right there. These are the regions where stars are being born right now 
as we speak. OK, so here's a smaller one. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, so these things are small clouds. They're filled with particular matter we call dust, gas that's mostly molecular hydrogen, but they also have water. And we can survey space for water, but we have to do it in very particular ways. So this is a spectrum. This is a brightness versus wavelength. And all these little lines here, except for this one and that one there, these things are different water molecules at different states of energy. And when they decay down, they release a photon, and we detect it. Now, water is a great thing. We're very happy to have it on this planet. Uh, but as an astronomer, it can be a little frustrating because when you look at this radiation that a water molecule emits in space, it's going to come down, it's going to hit our atmosphere, and it's going to be absorbed by a water molecule in the atmosphere. So if you want to be an astronomer to study water, uh, like myself, you have to use orbiting observatories, satellites in space. So you have to put something in space. And this was done with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And I was part of a survey uh, for water in space with, uh, by NASA's submillimeter wave astronomy satellite. OK, so we have all this water. We see it in space. And how is it made? So one thing that this brightness also tells you is it tells you how much water is there. And a typical cloud, even the smallest one, has enough to make over 10,000, 100,000 oceans of water. So it actually has lots of water in space. OK, so let's go back now to the beginning and try and think about where water came from. Well, the birth of the universe created hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of deuterium. And that's it. It didn't make that oxygen that's in water. It didn't make the carbon that is the basis for the chemistry of our life. And instead, that comes from fusion in the stars, where you take heavy elements and you create them out of the lighter elements. Okay? And as stars die, the more massive ones die in these uh, gigantic explosions and release that stuff into space. And this is a very beautiful, beautiful uh, picture taken from uh, both x-rays here. This is very hot gas. This is from the Chandra Observatory. And this stuff here is, is atoms shining out as they're being released back into space. And this stuff released back into space is the seeds for those molecular clouds that I showed you. Now, those seeds are very important. right? That comes out only as atoms. So they're not seeding these clouds with water. They're seeding it with atomic oxygen and hydrogen. And so something else has to happen to make that H2O. And actually, the way it does it, it doesn't work as O plus H2 goes to H2O. It's actually a little more complicated and much more circuitous than that. So how can we do chemistry in space? It seems kind of crazy that you can even think that you could figure this out. And well, there's a couple of ways we do it. Well, the first thing we do is we observe as many molecules as we can. And we've detected over 140 molecules in clouds. And we know which ones are the most abundant ones. So we take a chemical assay. All right, So that's, that's the first important step. And in fact, some molecules were detected first in space before they were detected here on Earth. All right, The conditions are also much more extreme. The pressure is 100 billion times below that of breathable air at only 10 to 20 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. So that really limits the type of chemistry that can occur. So it makes it actually tractable. So the number of reactions are reduced. The reactions only mostly occur in the gas, although as I'll show you, there is some solid state chemistry that happens. Uh, and only reactions between two partners. If you take something in the lab, you could have three things interacting and maybe making something else. Here it's only two because the pressures are so low. Okay? And the other thing we found is that reactions between ions and molecules are the things that dominate. An ion, of course, is, is a molecule or an atom that has been stripped of an electron. So here's the way things start. We make H2 first, and we have our oxygen. And what happens is these supernova not only release 
these atoms into space, they also release high energy particles that we call cosmic rays. And space is filled with cosmic rays. And in fact, right now, cosmic rays are going right through us right here as we speak. Those cosmic rays hit in H2, they ionize it, and that product eventually reacts with H2 and makes this molecule H3+, which does not react with H2. It'll find an oxygen and via a quick sequence make this molecule here, H3O+. We've observed this. This thing does not react with H2, so you have a sequence. H3+, plus, plus O goes to OH+, plus, that hits H2, goes to H2O+, plus, hits H2, goes to H3O+. Plus. Anything that can react with H2, it's, it's abundant, more abundant than any, than any other molecule by a factor of 10,000, sometimes even 100 million, right? So it's so much more abundant. If you react with it, it happens. So then this thing does not react with H2. That finds an electron and makes your water. So that's how we think you make water in space, or one of the ways, actually. And we've actually looked at all steps of the sequence and measured in the lab at temperatures of 20 to 30 degrees Kelvin. So we know this actually will happen. Right? So this is what we see. This is abundance of water relative to our dominant constituent H2 for a whole bunch of clouds. This is the survey that was done by the submillimeter wave astronomy satellite. And this is the theory. This is what that theory predicted. And so you know, we were all like, all right, we know what we're doing. We have all this, the answers. We have the reactions. We know what's right. Here's theory. We go out and we observe it. And we're like, oh, crap, right? We're down by two orders of magnitude. So there's a problem here. And the problem is that's not the full picture. What also can happen is you have these tiny little solids. And the atoms can stick on the grains, and they can actually react on the surface. And you can see this in the Earth. In fact, this is what's used to make some polymers and various things. It's called catalytic chemistry. Catalytic chemistry can happen in space, too. OK, so we can take that in our theory. And this is, what, this is a plot of that theory. This is abundance, again, relative to our dominant constituent. And you let things run according to time, ascribing a certain conditions. So if you start here with all your oxygen, gradually you'll make your water. But by far, the dominant thing is making water ice. So now you're making water as a solid on that surface. So the chemistry in space is a water ice factory. So what this does is it limits the amount of water that's found in the gas, just like we observed. All right, so the surface chemistry efficiently creates water ice. And again, these things are very, very cold. So they have high levels of deuterium dihydrogen. All right, and we actually can observe that, and we do. We see it. Now, we, I showed you a little bit of observations of water in the gas. Here's a picture of water as ice. So that's the last part of this picture. Now, ice can't rotate because it's in the solid state, but it can vibrate. So we can observe the vibration of ices. And they come out mostly in the infrared and not the radio. So this is another Spitzer Space Telescope. This is brightness versus wavelength. This is the vibrational mode of water ice. We also detect methyl alcohol, methane in the gas. These are the dust grains that are mostly silicates, kind of like sand. All right and carbon dioxide ice. So this water is created as ice long before a star is born, about a million years before a star is born. The water is created in the cloud that's going to make a star. And a single cloud has over 100,000 oceans worth of water. All right, so we're going to make a star and planet. We have this cloud. I've explained to you a little bit about the chemistry that goes on in that cloud. And this thing is about 100 billion miles, and it's got to collapse down to something that's about 25,000 miles. And to put that in perspective, again, we have the wonderful state of Pennsylvania with the beautiful city of Philadelphia. You collapse the whole thing down to the size of this building here, Independence Hall. That's equivalent, like, wow, right? You want to talk scales? You're really squashing this thing, taking this thing as low density, and making it a lot denser so that you can power fusion. So that's star formation. 
So gravity wins and pulls that cloud inward so you make a star. Now, what happens is these clouds are rotating. All right? And as it collapses, it flattens to a disk. So why does that happen? All right, well, if you think about it, if you take something on a string and you throw it over your head like this, right, and it spins around, it's very difficult to get it to spin right above you, right, because of centrifugal force. So the stuff that's spinning and collapsing, this stuff on the edges here is going to have to spin down and down and down before it gets to the center. But the stuff that's right up top is going to go right in and collapse like a pancake. Okay, so that's why this thing collapses to a disk. All right? So it's conservation of angular momentum here is part of this. It flattens into a disk. And the planets are born in that disk around the star. So there we go. That's why all the planets lie in a plane. This is something that has been theorized uh, for over 200 years. It was first proposed by Immanuel Kant, noted philosopher. Okay. And the water created in the cloud is provided to this disk as a form of ice coating these tiny solid grains. All right, so we have these tiny solid grains. And they have to now do something to make planets, OK? Now, just first, we actually have observed disks around other stars, so we know you know, we have the clues in our solar system, but these are all pictures of disks around other stars. And this last one here is a really particularly beautiful one. This dark lane here is the disk. This is the surface of the disk, which is reflecting light from the star. So all the stuff you see here is reflected light off the surface of that disk. This disk is about 10 million years old. So. These orbiting submicron tiny things get together and they start accreting in the midplane of this disk where it's really dense. And they make centimeter sized things, meter sized things. It takes about somewhere between three to maybe 10 million years for this process to make meter sized bodies. All right? These planetesimals now, these meter-sized bodies, eventually become kilometer-sized bodies. They start colliding together. They make planets. All right? And the last piece of this picture is that the nebula, what we call the solar nebula, the gas cloud or the dis disk that the sun was born in, is really hot in the center. Because of course, you have the star there. The star is born, it's releasing all this energy. And so it's really hot close to the star and really cold far away from the star. So what does that mean? Well, on a warm day, which we pray will come soon, uh, that ice is going to evaporate, right? And go into the air and start the cycle again. Well, what that means is that there is going to be a portion of this nebula that's going to be too hot for the ice to exist in the solid state. Right? It's actually the pressure so low that the liquid phase doesn't exist. It goes back into the gas. And that's also true for the rocks. There's going to be parts of this nebula that are too hot for some rocks to condense. This is called condensation. So different elements or molecules form in different regions due to temperature. So if we look at this nebula here, this is the vertical direction. This is the radial direction. This is the blue stuff here is really hot. And the red stuff here is really cold, and it has a slight flaring to it because we actually observe these disks are flared, so the outer parts are puffier than the inner parts. So what, here's the Earth, Mars, Jupiter. And what you find is that inside of the orbit of Mars, the temperatures are so hot that only rocks will condense. No ices, no water ice. Beyond the orbit of Mars, you get rocks and water ice. And beyond about the orbit of Jupiter, you get other ices like methane and ammonia. And actually, the moon of Titan, the moon of Saturn, Titan, is very rich in methane. And that's because of this. All right? So what this tells you is, OK, we now know 
that it explains the fact that the amount of ice increased when we went away from the sun, right? That fills in that gap. All right, well, that's great. But if you look at this, then, rocks that made the Earth shouldn't have had any water. But yet, we have water. So why is that? What happened there? OK. So to do that, I'm going to show you a simulation made by a gentleman uh, by the name of Sean Raymond. <clears throat> and what happens is you have this disk filled with these planetesimals. The stuff close to the sun are rocks, and stuff further away are icy planetesimals. These things are orbiting the sun, and they have near circular orbits, not exactly circular orbits. <coughs> and the initial evolution is, is very chaotic. There's lots of interactions. So you have things that come close to each other, and when they do, their near circular orbits get changed, because there's a gravitational interaction. And one of these things, probably the lighter one, gets thrown in to a more elliptical orbit. So the, the circle stretches out, and the eccentricity of that orbit increases. And of course, what that means is it starts going into the inner solar system, where it could then maybe collide with things like the forming Earth, forming Mars, forming Venus. All right, so here's a plot. Uh, it's the simulation. It's going to show you this is eccentricity here, and this is distance from the sun. So when you get around the orbit of Mars and beyond the orbit of Mars, you have these icy planetesimals. So the blue ones have lots of water, green just a little bit of water, and the red ones are completely dry. And when the simulation starts, these rocks are going to start interacting with each other, and their eccentricities are going to start increasing. All right? The really big ones stay in place, and you'll see that. But eccentricity increases means it starts going to start interacting with stuff on the inside, maybe also on the outside. So there it goes. These are all gravitational interactions. And what you'll see is over time, we're at about 10 million years here, the stuff forming in around 1 to 2 AU will start getting blue. And that's all coming from beyond, at or near, or beyond the orbit of Mars. So this chaos of the birth of the planet system is essentially where the Earth got its water. It got it from what's called the asteroid belt, okay? The region of the nebula where ices could exist was excited through gravitational interactions, and it started throwing all the stuff out here, out and in, and the stuff that went in found the big thing. And the big thing on the rock was the Earth, Venus, Mars, and you start getting the water. OK, so that's how the Earth got its oceans. All right, It came from the asteroid belt. But here's the trick, right? The water was not created in that disk. It was made a million years before the planet was born. OK, so water is ancient. That water that's in that glass right there, that oxygen and that hydrogen got together and reacted and formed. It was born 4.7 billion years ago. It's one of the oldest things on this planet, right? Yes, we can destroy water and we, we, we can create it on this planet. But that's only a small fraction of the water. Most of the water is primordial, okay? It is ancient. That's a very interesting statement, right? OK, so now I'm going to end talking a little bit about other Earths and how we might try and find water on other Earths. So this picture here is a picture of the Earth uh, taken from Mars. It's a little dot here, OK? Now, Abundant water is created and supplied to all forming Earths. Every single Earth that's formed, any terrestrial world forming anywhere, has water supplied to it. Okay, the water's there, there's lots of it. It's just the way planets are born. It's all part of the process. All right? So 
I think the presence of water, if we're going to find another Earth, is, is one of the keys of when we're going to look in and zero in. If we find another terrestrial world, we're going to try want to know, does this have water? So how are we going to know it? Well, there's a couple ways. Well, the first is what's called the habitable zone. If you look in the Earth, Venus is too hot. So it uh, actually boiled all of its water off. And solar photons hit the, hit the atmosphere of Venus and over time broke the water up. And the hydrogen was lost to space, and the oxygen went down to the surface and rusted the surface. Mars is dry and cold. It's too cold. The water is mostly frozen. So uh, the Earth is in the just right spot, right? The so-called Goldilocks effect, right? You know, So it's, Earth is in just the right place for water to not only exist, but exist on its surface in the form of liquid. So we define something we call the habitable zone. That is, the region around the star where a terrestrial world would keep water as a liquid form on its surface. Now, what you're going to do is if you're going to find other Earths, and we're going to find them within the next 10 years, I'm certain of it, you're going to ask, well, where is it and how far away is it from its star? Now, it will depend on whether the star is significantly more massive than our sun or not as massive as our sun because there's more radiation, more heat, right? But there's this definable zone, and we can do that. And we can say, aha, we not only have found an Earth, we found an Earth where there should have water. Now, that's an indirect statement. Uh, what you really want to do then is go off and take a spectrum and look for water in the atmosphere of that world. And here is one world where we can take a spectrum of it. This is the spectrum of the Earth. And this is the radiance or brightness, if you will, versus wavelength. And all these little things here, that's water, all that little stuff. And so that's what we're going to look for. Another key marker that we're going to look for, and I didn't talk about this here, uh, of course, is molecular oxygen. Now, all that chemistry that I talked about that made water, it doesn't make molecular oxygen. Molecular oxygen is not provided to planets when they're born. And oxygen that's on the Earth was created by life. Most of it was created about 2 to 2.5 billion years ago by tiny little bacteria, cyanobacteria, that were prevalent on the surface of our planet. All right. So if you want to look for oxygen, it reacts in our atmosphere. It forms ozone, which has a very prominent feature. So we're going to look for water. We're going to look for ozone. And I'm going to end uh, with this one picture here. Someday, maybe not for the next 30, 40 years, we'll take a picture. It's very hard. We don't have the technology to do it today. This is a picture uh, of the Earth, a simulated picture of the Earth, as seen from a distance of 1,000 trillion miles. This is three times more distance than the nearest star, that's Alpha Centauri, using an imaginary array of you took 150, 30, three meter telescopes. <laughs> it's a lot of money to build such a thing. We don't have the money today. We really don't have the money today. Uh, but someday, maybe we'll get here. And so thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, enjoy your ancient water. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.